Thank you, Agatha. Uh, maybe we can start with an introduction. So, Carlos, would you like to introduce? Yeah, so thank you again, everyone, for coming. Um, I've been talking for Agatha for the past months in order to organize uh, this event. For me, particularly, Weights and Biases is a tool that I've been using for the majority of my PhD. And it's really giving me value and it's made me uh, improve my workflow. So when they approached me to say that they wanted to do a webinar here, I thought it was a very good idea also to introduce some other students and PhD candidates to this platform. And we're joining by Agatha and Ayush. Ayush will be the main, the main speaker of this webinar. And as he said, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. Feel free, uh, this is, let's try to make it a conversation. And I'll leave, it, I'll leave it to you from here. Thank you for coming. Awesome. Uh, Agatha, do you want to introduce yourself? And then yeah, sure. And then... So very quickly, I'm Agatha, I'm project manager, weights and biases. I manage the academic program. So if in the future you have any ideas how to collaborate with us, we're very open. We do sponsorships for clubs. We do sponsorships for events. We do a lot of um, a lot of collaborations. So I'll be your person to go to. And we have Ayush here, who is the actual machine learning engineer that will lead the session. So um, yeah, Ayush. Yeah, uh, so I've been working at Weights and Biases for past almost three years now. And I also have a deep interest in computer vision. A lot of the work that I do uh, involves computer vision. So maybe we can, some of us maybe collab can collaborate on some project in future as well. So I uh, hope I can convince you all with my presentation skill here that I can be good for collaboration. Yeah, so let's go ahead. This whole presentation is about uh, how you can follow an ideal ML workflow, uh, how it can be iterative, how it can be collaborative, and how it can be reproducible at the same time. Uh, and everything is offered by Weights and Biases uh, like as a single source of truth. Before we jump into, these are the three accounts that you always require for the Kaggle competition that we're gonna run at the very end. So if you don't have a Kaggle account, Feel free to create one, you just require a Google account. If you don't have a Weights and Versus account yet, you can create one. You can use your GitHub for, to authenticate OneDB or a Google account. Uh, and then if you have a Google account, you will obviously have a collab, not, uh, col access to collab notebook. So I will be sharing a collab notebook with all of you that will have the code to run uh, for the Kaggle competition and I generate the submission file for the Kaggle competition. Having said that, this course is kind of an overview of all the products and features that we have, but we also have a dedicated course called Effective MLOps. Uh, uh, and we have, it was created by Thomas, Derek, and Hamel. Hamel Hussain is someone who is quite respected in our community, as well as Thomas and Derek, who are my coworkers. Uh, and this course will go into more advanced uh, features of its ambassadors and how you can use this to do ML ops properly. Uh, so that's something that you all can try out maybe after this call and whenever you get time. Yeah, now let's get into the main crux of the matter. Also, I just wanna in stop here to ask if the slides are visible to all of you. Or should I? Yeah. They are, but maybe if you could full screen it, it will be easier to read. Mm, okay, I can. It's just that I will have to just go back and forth. Anyway. Uh, Cool. So the goal uh, as a machine learning practitioner or an engineer or anything is to like produce some sort of comparable results. So we see a lot of research papers when we see these fancy tables wherein there are some methods compared against a metric on some data set. Uh, and then you tend to highlight the method that creates the best score for that given metric. This, what you see on the screen is the end result. But in order to have this concise piece of new knowledge that we share as a research paper, we have to run a ton of experiments. And machine learning is all about experimentations, right? So you can be someone who create uses text file uh, to keep a log of all, like keep a log of the hyperparameters that you are using to train a given model, the amount of time the model took to train, the metrics that it generated. You might Noted down on a piece of paper. I have I have known some ML researchers 
who have discovered interesting concepts in ML and they have used pen and paper because when they be or such similar tools were not existent then. Uh, you might be someone uh, who is using Excel sheet uh, to keep track of the same thing that I spoke, spoke about, the hyperparameters and the metrics, or you might be using TensorBoard. So we all at some point in our life while doing machine learning uh, might have used some like either three, either of these three or one of these three or whatever uh, to keep track of our metrics and all. But it, it had its place and time, but it's kind of outdated because the moment you wanna scale it up, when the moment you wanna collaborate with say two, uh, like a team member or maybe three team members, or your lab might have n number of uh, individuals working on the same project, it's a mess because everyone is like keeping track of their experiments and like keeping log of everything in, in, in their respective silos. It's not easy to share. Uh, you might be sharing your Jupyter notebooks or your Collab notebooks, script files over emails or maybe slacking them or maybe creating PowerPoint presentations with the results that you gain that particular week of your research. Uh, you might be discussing or going over the, the results over like Microsoft Team or Slack or Zoom, or maybe discussing what Discord server. So like the point I'm trying to drive here is that there are n number of tools out there which basically caters to collaboration and sharing of resources and the results, but it's just too much. It's, it's something that's very inefficient. You will lose track of the, of the information that's been already shared. A lot of information is lost in all these different mode of communication. But if you are someone who is pain tolerant, you might say that it's fine, but there should be a better solution. So that better solution uh, leads to the three principles of an ideal workflow. These three principles will be uh, easy to iterate and especially like iterations would be very fast. It should be reproducible and it should be collaborative in nature, right? So let me go through each one of these three ideal principles and how ways and process can be helpful uh, in, in, in this regard. Let's start with the rapid iteration. So say you have four members in your team and everyone is keeping track of their experiments using their method, say Excel sheet or TensorBoard or whatnot. With case and biases, you can keep track of, like every member can log their experiments to a single source of the Awaits and Biases dashboard or Awaits and Biases project. And then that can act as a single source of throat for further insights that you wanna draw from, for the, uh, like you can use that to like share with your colleagues. You can do n number of things. There are a lot of powerful things that can happen the moment you keep track of everything in a, in a single place. And to get started, it requires just 60, 60 seconds or less because all you need to do is pip install WANDB, uh, initialize a WANDB run. A WANDB run is basically a single experiment that you are about to run, right? And once you uh, initialize a run, you can just log whatever metrics you want to log. You can log images, videos, et cetera. I will, I will demo all of those as well. And then once we're done logging, everything is, can be visualized and interacted with in a single project page. And if you all think I am lying that it doesn't, that it might take more than 60 seconds, I have a quick collab notebook here, one sec. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a collab notebook that I quickly created. So as you can see, all you need to do is pip install WANDB. It's a pip installable. You need to import WANDB in your Jupyter notebook or in a script. If you're using script or a, a VM or a local computer, you just need to authenticate that machine once by calling wandb.login. Uh, if it's a collab notebook or something like that, which is not persistent, you need to call wandb.login. So once you call that, you will be asked to put in an API key which is something that you get when you create a WANDB account. So when you have a WANDB account, you will get some a key like this, which you can just input here, and then that machine is authenticated to log anything to its buses. Here, you can see I am initializing a 
when they be run. So the project name is my demo run here. So everything is gonna be logged to my demo run. I am looping through something and logging the metrics using this dictionary. So rundb.log dot, run dot is, a, is a simple utility that you can use to log anything. And you just need to pass in a dictionary. It can, the dictionary can have anything, right? And then that's it. Uh, a tip here, if you are on a Jupyter notebook, wherein the session is something that, I mean, RunDB cannot have the knowledge that you want to finish a run and that you need to start another run in the same notebook. In a script, when you run the script, it's like end to end. So you don't need to call RunDB.finish there, but in a Jupyter notebook, you need to do so. So once you do that, you will get a URL, which is where the RunDB, uh, which is where all the runs are logged. In this case, the school river one is the name of the run. And my power metric is the metric that I log using that for loop. You get, I mean, you might question that, do I need to do all of this just to log uh, some metric to weights and biases? Why not just keep track on the next week? The best part is that you get more automatically by just doing oneDB.log and oneDB.init. And I will show what else you get by doing so. But let's jump back to the presentation uh, before we go into that. Yeah. So as I like right now, I just showed that you can log some scalar value, some vector, like some scalar value to weights and biases, some metric to weights and biases, but you are not limited to just some scalar values. You can also log images. You can log the segmentation mask or the panoptic segmentation mask, whatever, like mask, the bounding boxes, the images to weights and biases. If you are someone who is working with uh, point cloud and then doing 3D object detection on that point cloud, maybe LiDAR data. You can log that LiDAR data to its and biases. You can log audio if you are interested in, you can log the raw audio file. You can maybe generate the spectrogram or mel spectrogram, log that. You can log any matplotlib or plotly figure to its and biases directly. You can also log uh, videos or GIFs to its and biases. If you are, I mean, I know that this, this lab is not NLP focused, but again, like we we are living in the in a world where multimodality is a thing now. You pass in some text, you get some images. Uh, so you can also log text to weights and biases. If you have created some fancy visualization using Plotly, for example, uh, and that visualization is very niche to your use case, you can literally log the HTML to weights and biases and you have all the interactiveness that you get in a plotly figure. On top of that, you have a system of record. It's not like you are gonna, uh, that, that that chart that you have logged, is gonna get lost. You can revisit that after many weeks or many months for that matter, right? So with weights and biases, we are trying to uh, enable our users to log any data type uh, there might be something that we might be missing. We have tried to cover every data type possible, but say if you uh, don't find a data type that we are sup not supporting yet, you can just email us and then we'll try to build something for you, hack away something or build something permanently that we can, that we can support you to log to its biases. Now, before I jump into my next segment, let me just show you how it looks when we log the bounding boxes and segmentation mask. So this is an image that was logged to weights and biases. Uh, so this looks like image from a dash cam of a car. It might be useful for a self-driving car or yeah, driving assistant kind of use case. So we wanna know where are the different cars, what are the objects? So we can see the bounding boxes here. So the, the bounding boxes of interest here are the cars, Let's see if I turn this on. Yeah, there's only car uh, that's of in, that's in our annotated data set. Uh, you can also log the segmentation mask. So you can see the roads, the pathways, the greenery, uh, the poles, etc. So 
you can even separate out the the images with the mask. Let's go to ground truth here. So you can see that this section belong to the uh, to the road. There's this a uh, slight difference in the color between the car and the road. So there's no overlap here. So it's a ground truth mask properly logged. Uh, what else? Yeah. So say you are logging the mask and you also are logging the ground truth uh, to, to weights and biases. So what you can do here is, like say there are some multiple images and let me just get out the, the image, uh, the prediction. So on the left-hand side, we have the raw, the, the raw images. Then center column, we have the predictions. And on the left-hand side, we have the ground truth. And all these were logged for the first epoch or maybe the first batch of you training the model, right? So as you can see, the, the prediction is not that good. There's a lot of overlap and it's not accurately predicting, right? Now let's jump to say middle of our trading run. So the model was trained for say 10 epochs at this point of time. We might be able to see a slight improvement in the, in the segmentation capability of our model. Let's look at the final epoch. Yeah, and there's like a slightly better uh, prediction. Let's, let's look at this image. There's this human being here. Uh, this is the prediction after 20 epoch of our model trading. Let's look at the prediction at the first epoch for that man. Yeah, so as you can see this, the model is not actually be able to predict the man in the very first epoch. So by just sliding through, I can see that the model improved over time when training. Right? So this is something that you get out of the box. You don't have need to write any custom code to create something like this. All you need to do is log something to some devices appropriately. Uh, yeah, so that was, me logging images, but I also mentioned that when you when you log something to weights and biases, you just don't get the metrics, the images, or the molecule, or HTML, whatever. You get a lot more out of the box. So here I have trained a vision transformer small with pass size sixteen uh, on I guess Stanford Doc dataset. So these are different metrics. So the learning rate has been decayed using cosine. You can see the accuracy improving, the loss going down. Uh, and these are the metrics that I have captured uh, using a Keras integration or Keras callback called metrics logger. Like we have integration for all the popular frameworks, PyTorch Lightning, Keras, TensorFlow, FastAI, et cetera, et cetera. We have a hugging face. We have integrations with everything. So you don't necessarily need to write your own logging code. You can just pass in that callback and everything will be captured automatically. But that's just metrics. What else are we capturing here? We are capturing <coughs> the system metrics for the run. So you can see the CPU utilization over time. Uh, what's of interest for me is that uh, in my, like when my strain is where the 100, almost 100% 100 of the GPU memory was utilized or allocated for that job. And the CPU, uh, GPU utilization looks healthy to me. Like uh, it is going from 100% all the way down to 24%. So there might be something that I can improve in my data pipeline to such that the GPU doesn't need to wait for a period of time where the utilization is dipping. So this is an insight that I just got from the fact that GPU metrics were captured automatically by weights and biases. What else? Uh, yeah, so say you are printing something on the STD out. So STD out is also captured automatically as logs. Um, yeah, you have the requirements.txt file. So all the environments that were, all the packages that were there uh, in your environment when you are training that model, everything is gonna be captured automatically with the version as well. This way, you can just do pip install from that requirement.txt to reproduce the run uh, or to reproduce the experiment, right? So it just makes everything reproducible as well. Uh, what else? 
uh, yeah, so it took almost like 53 minutes and 16 seconds to train this DRT small model. Uh, yeah, this train.py file or this command was used to train the model. If you have a long command with a lot of arguments and all, you can just, everything will be captured automatically. I know that the model was trained with a Tesla P100. Uh, I had this one GPU, there were four CPUs, what version of NDB was used. I can also keep track of all the hyperparameters that was used to train the model. So this model was trained with a batch size of 64 with a learning rate of one E minus four, the image size was 64. So you can log all these configuration of hyperparameters to weights and biases, uh, which is gonna make your life really easy when you are doing a ton of experiments. You can just revisit all the experiments back after a few weeks or months. Uh, so that was one single experiment, but let me show you what a workspace looks like. So in this particular project, what I did was I was training uh, a mobile net V2 on fashion and my data set. And I just wanted to experiment with cosine decay, right? So when you decay the learning rate, you can set the steps till which the learning rate is gonna decay and then it's gonna yeah, remain flat after that, right? So, uh, so like, yeah, I trained some baseline model and then I trained uh, with different decay steps for the cosine, uh, for, for the cosine decay learning scheduler. And if I look at the evaluation, I can clearly see the baseline and every model was trained three times for me. So I have the mean and the standard deviation of the model evaluation accuracy. So the baseline had the evaluation accuracy of some 85.29%. But when I use cosine decay, I guess I got the best uh, result when the cosine decay had a step value, step decay value of 70%. So I improved my baseline by using cosine decay to 91.26%. That's almost uh, what, six point some percent gain uh in in my valid in my evaluation accuracy so that's really amazing uh i can maybe just click on one run here uh yeah and then i again have access to the system metrics uh the different logs uh one interesting thing that i also want to mention is that say you are using scripts uh, and changing a lot in that script to train your models. You can also save the code and your Jupyter notebook session if you are using a Jupyter notebook to weights and biases. <laughs> and yeah, you can just keep track of the code as well. You can keep track of the Jupyter notebook session as well, which is really powerful if you think about it. Uh, you don't test it because an ideal workflow might be you make some changes, you trade, uh, you make some changes in a script, you get commit that changes to a repository, you then train the model, and then maybe connect that training job with that Git version, which is kind of complicated. Now, all you are doing is saving the code along with the experiment that you are running. So you actually know what changes you made when training that model. Uh, you have some features of diffing as well here, uh, but yeah, let's move ahead. Uh, Okay, is there any questions so far? I could give a small question. How do you um, how do you log the mean and standard deviation? Because I normally just do it very simply. I log two things separately. <laughs> yeah, so you are <coughs> one sec. Yeah, you are referring to this cosine decay example that I showed, right? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So actually, it's not me who's computing the mean and the standard deviation. What I did was I trained, uh, say, if I'm calling, if there's a main function, and in that main function, I have the trading logic, I just ran that main function thrice. So it created three VanDB runs and logged everything to a single, to a single group. Yeah, so once you group by something in that, in this case, the group name is, uh, one sec. 
that. Yeah, it's cosine decay underscore 1.0 underscore B2. So once you group by, you get the standard deviation, you get more things. Like, let me actually show you. If I edit panel and go to grouping, so I automatically have mean, median, min max, and the range standard deviation, min max, standard error. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so you have all of this automatically given the fact that you are grouping by something. And if you ask me how one can create groups, one can create groups in the UI, but what I prefer doing is when I <coughs> do vandb.init, uh, I just pass in something called group equals to some names here, cosine dk one zero, and then run it n number of times. Like you can configure it your, like according to your read, right? And then it will be grouped automatically in the VanDB dashboard and you have the mean and standard division and everything. Right, thank you for the answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's, let's move on. Uh, <coughs> right. Uh, let me share my screen. <coughs> Right, so that was us logging everything to recent values. But now let's try to ask a few important questions about the data and the model. Uh, we can obviously use Jupyter Notebook. We can use something called Pandas, <coughs> maybe create some uh, Streamlit or Grid IO apps, use Plotly, et cetera, et cetera. There's n number of tools to, uh, to build th something, to ask some important questions about the data that was used to train the model and the model itself and the model prediction uh, during inference. But I start with uh, the tabular data. We all have, we all know what a tabular data is. It's, it's just a CSV file. You have categorical features and other features as well in that in as columns. So using something like pandas, you can do something like filtering. You can split and then combine and apply and group by. You can even create fancy charts using pandas. But the moment you want to translate from tabular data to non-tabular data, and you try to use the same kind of tool like pandas, you have something like this, where, wherein all the images will look like this, wherein the image is the object stored in the memory, right? It is of no value. We don't actually can see the image there with the path to the object, right? What if you can visualize the images or the text, whatever, along with the ground truth label or the model prediction or whatever meta information you have for that data set? So we have something called vandb.table uh, that you can use to ask important questions about the data because you can do something like group by uh, and you can have, you can, you can generate insights about the, about the, about the, data set that you are using to train the model. And let me try to actually demo one real quick here. Yeah, so here, what you see on a screen is a, is a one DB table, wherein I'm logging the images of from fashion image data set. I have logged the index and I have also logged the epoch, which now, oh, okay, let's actually use this. Um, yeah. So you have the uh, the ID of the image. It can be the path of the image. It can be any metadata for that matter. You have the images and you have the ground truth. So maybe I can do something like group by the ground truth. And thus, I can see all the images that belong to the ground truth with the label zero. And I can visualize the images. And that way, I can kind of become one with the data. I can find out the data that was mislabeled, the data that was, uh, that I mean, there, there might be some faults in the data, that there might be some data that doesn't even belong to the distribution that you are trying to model, right? So you can find all those information when you visualize the data set with something as powerful as one DB table. <laughs> uh, what question. more you can do, yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, one question. Can you also put uh, videos, for example? Yes, you can put videos. So all the data types that I showed you, the videos, molecule, audio, et cetera, you can log everything to one DB table. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, uh, 
toho Sorry about my laptop. If I was on a Mac, it should not have been an issue. Uh, but I think try to show something interesting here. Yeah, uh, say, uh, like I showed one DB table for the usage of visual data, but as I said, like it's a two D grid, right? So you can log anything uh, using one DB table. In this case, in this instance, I am logging the predictions of the model along with the ground truth as well. So I can do something like, uh, say, if I group by predictions here, right? Just to see <laughs> how my model is doing. I don't need uh, epoch here, let's remove this. I don't need maybe the IDs. Uh, I can remove this as well. Let's look at the image and the ground truth. So say my model is predicting zero, then for the given images, some of the images were been predicted as two and five. So I can clearly <laughs> know that there are some images for which my images uh, for which my model is faulty. Uh, in the in the case of prediction one, almost all the all the images were correctly labeled. So I need to do some sort of maybe I need to collect more data. I need to do some augment specific augmentation to improve the quality of the model for this given prediction. You can even see the you can also find out the number of images that were locked. <coughs> sorry, the number of images that were logged for a given class, or maybe for a given class, there were few images that were logged. So you need to collect more data there, right? So you can do all these kind of uh, you can gain these kind of insights if you use something like one db tables, uh, which you can obviously not get from using pandas or something like that, right? So that was me asking some question about uh, the data. What about the training? So say you have a pipeline setup and you wanna find the best set of hyperparameters for that given configuration, for that given task or the pipeline that you have, right? So you can use something called WANDB sweeps <coughs> to easily do a hyperparameter search and yeah, and you have some powerful charts that will automatically be generated when you do that. And let me demo one to all of you. Um, and I guess Carlos mentioned that this is the feature that actually, uh, yeah, made him try with some buses, if I'm correct. Yes, that's how they got me. Yeah. So uh, this is a sweep page. And <coughs> say <laughs> what? 312, 314 experiments were conducted, right? And different hyperparameters were used, like early stopping rounds, the gamma, the learning rate, the child weight, et cetera, right? And we wanna optimize for the AUC metric, the validation AUC metric. So let's try to find out the set of hyperparameters that gave the best AUC. In this case, a learning rate between 0 0.8 and 0 0.85 gave the best validation accuracy. Uh, the gamma distribution ranges from somewhere 0 0.45 to 0 0.72, right? There's no definitive answer for the early stopping round. So like some went till 40, some were 20, some were 10, right? So based on this information, you can maybe run another set of hyperparameter sweep uh, by narrowing down the search space. Maybe next time you can narrow the search space to 0 0.8, to 0 0.85 and find out even granular uh, values for the learning rate that will optimize the performance of the, the AUC metric here. That was, uh, yeah, using, this is something called parallel coordinate plot. This is a scatter plot of the best model that you get uh, across different time steps, right? Uh, and all of these are generated automatically. You don't need to build anything, right? Uh, another important or powerful feature that we have is called parameter importance plot. So using this, you can see that the child weight has a negative correlation, which means that if you reduce the child weight, the AUC will in increase. Uh, for learning rate, it has a positive correlation and a strong uh, and a strong one. So if you increase decrease the learning rate, the AUC will decrease. That's what that's the insight that we got. That's kind of counterintuitive, but that's the insight that we got 
by the sweep that we have selected, right? And you can see how important that parameter is for the given set of, for the given metric. Uh, yeah, you can also see all the system metrics and all the like fancy log loss and the, the AUC, et cetera. So that's the power of sweep. You can use this to find literally the best model that you are trying to optimize for. So that's sweep. Uh, I think that you can do is you can basically run sweep across different machines. So you can do parallel optimization if you have multiple machines uh, to run a heavy sweep job. So that was uh, ideating quickly uh, through the workflow. Uh, now let's come to reproducibility. And I have touched upon a few points about reproducibility, like the fact that OneDB is automatically capturing the requirement.txt file, uh, which is all the different packages that was there in the environment along with the version, which is very important to reproduce the results. But let's imagine a typical workflow wherein you start in some raw data, you preprocess that to create a training data set, and then you use a training file along with some pre-trained model to fine tune that model. And then you use some eval data and run this eval.py step to see how well the model that that fine tune model is performing on the hold out eval data set, right? So that's a typical uh, artifact, uh, typical pipeline. And this pipeline is something that you can capture on weights and biases using something called one db artifacts. Uh, I will try to show that as well, but let's uh, try to understand that given an image from the eval data, in this case, a cute dog, if this cute dog was uh, was predicted paper towel with a probability of 98%, which is that the model is really confident that this cute dog is not a dog, but a paper towel, then what went long, wrong, right? So it can be a number of things. It can be that there was some training log, there was some flaw in the training logic, or maybe there was some flaw in the evaluation pipeline. Uh, maybe the pretend model that you used uh, to fine tune on, that was something that might not be appropriate for that task. That pretend model was maybe trained on uh, natural images, but your use case is medical in nature, so it might not be translating well there. Maybe the way you are preprocessing the raw data set, there's some issue with the preprocessing. Maybe you are shuffling the annotations while you are preprocessing. Uh, or maybe you just started with a wrong data set. So with this pipeline, so if you're capturing the lineage using artifact like this, you literally can backtrack uh, to the problem that led to a bad evaluation uh, for that given sample. Uh, right, so there can be a number of issues. Uh, there can be different versions of the preprocess pi, uh, pre process the pi file, same with the train file, et cetera. So at this point, again, if you're pain tolerant, you will see that you're fine, but there should be a better way of debugging it. Right, so there are N ways to do so. Let's start with the code. So I showed uh, previously that with Facebook Basis, you can capture the script or the notebook, Jupyter notebook session uh, for that given experiment that you ran, right? So you can maybe revisit that and check what was something that you changed for that given experiment compared to a different one wherein the model was performing well. So in this case, and let me actually enlarge this. Yeah, in this case, I'm not sure if you can see, but uh, the format for the data was changed for, from BGR to RGB, and that might have created issue uh, because the model assumes that you are gonna train with BGR format, but the data set that's provi been provided is in the RGB format. So it's not, it might be an issue there. Uh, let's look at the input. Maybe the person who created the raw data set, he changed the bounding box definition. So you can capture the changes as nodes. So the, the, the user who has created a new version for the data set can provide the note that this is what the, this is the change for that given data set. And in this case, it was that the bounding boxes or the bounding box definition was changed. So obviously if you're changing the definition here, you have to change the training 
logic, you have to also change the evaluation logic or the inference, right? So this is like a good prediction. This is for the bad prediction. And for a good prediction, more images were added and some annotation was updated. But that was still OK, because there was no issue when you check the evaluation using one DB table. But someone just changed the definition. And that's why you are seeing that that prediction. So you can backtrack to the fact that the prediction, the wrong prediction is due to the change in the raw data. Uh, I also showed one DB table to see the model predictions, right? So uh, as I demoed that, you can literally use tables to find uh, images for so to find uh, the the model prediction, which is faulty for a given ground truth label. So in this case, say if the model is predicting plant A, uh, the truth is the truth distribution is something like insecta, fungi, aves, reptilia, etc. Right. So the model is actually not working that good here. Uh, so yeah, so this is how you can like debug by actually visualizing the prediction. The best part in my personal opinion is that uh, if say you are doing the same thing with matplotlib, uh, then you can only visualize say 32 samples or 28 samples in a Jupyter notebook. But with this, you can literally visualize thousands or 100,000 samples all at once and gain the insight as to what is wrong with the data set. Uh, yeah, and I would love at this point to stop and demo something interesting. Uh, Agatha, are we good with time? Yeah, uh, I was just I about to say we're quite short on time. So um, <laughs> I know yeah. we all love weights and biases and there is a, we could speak and speak about it for the next week. Um, but let's just move on to the final, final stuff and make sure to get people's hands on it. Yeah, yeah definitely. I was, yeah, definitely. Uh, right. Maybe once I'm done with this and I just talk about the character composition, if anyone is interested, I can just demo one quick thing. Uh, and then final piece is collaboration. So again, n number of individuals working in a single team, they have n, like different workflows. With face and biases, you have a single source of truth. But just having a source of truth, just having a dashboard is not enough because still there's a lot of information that a human being cannot parse just by looking at it, right? Uh, like a colleague of you might ask for some sort of loss and CPU utilization metric that you might not have considered to even log or even consider to keep a track of, but the fact that your professor or colleague is asking for it, you can uh, backtrack, create a report, and I'm gonna just show what a report is, and then just hand over that report to your colleague by sharing the link to the report. And as I mentioned that one day is keeping track of a lot of things automatically. So you might be capturing the CPU utilization and you're not even aware of it, right? So let me just quickly show what a report looks like and then we can just go back, uh, to, go to the kind of competition. So this is uh, this is like a one DB report wherein you have some title, you can like put in some text. You don't need to take the screenshot of the model loss and model accuracy and whatnot because everything is present in one DB and you can just pull it and keep it here. And you can even interact with it, which is the best part. You can put in the sweeps parallel candidate plot here. You can put in the table, uh, and then you can format it as well. You can put in code blocks, to do list, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, YouTube links as well. And if you are doing hardcore research, you can use this one DB table to keep a journal sort of thing. So when Boris was training his Dali uh, Mini or uh, Dali Mega, which is a stable diffusion model. Or, 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 or sorry, yeah, diffusion model, I guess. So he used one DB table to keep track of all the work he was doing, of all the things that he experimented, like for example, here, 800 million train sample, and then he got something, some results, and then he was maintaining this single piece of truth or a journal per se, uh, using this one DB report. And you can use this to like share it with your colleague, the professor, whatever, and you can discuss you don't so by doing so you don't need to go out of the 1db ecosystem 
uh, to create a PowerPoint presentation with all the screenshots of the results, etc. You can just put everything here and share it, and that your teammate can just read through it when he or she has time. Now I will just quickly uh, touch upon the fact that we we support a lot of open source research, a lot of big labs are part of its biases and we are supporting uh, like our customers or we are partnering with them in some income capacity. Uh, a lot of the open source community like Stability, Eleuther, Carper, OpenFold, they all use its biases for the research. And we're really proud of this fact because we are enabling uh, genuine science. And finally, uh, with and biases will fit in any of your workflow. It is integrated with all the major frameworks out there. It is framework agnostic. So you can use TensorFlow, PyTorch, whatever, and it will work. It is also platform agnostic. So you can write a piece of script, instrument that with and biases on a local computer, and you can scale that up on cluster or GCP or AWS, whatever. You don't need to change anything. It will just capture everything even when you translate from local system to a VM or a cluster. So that was me running through the, 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 the like giving an overview of what Vision Biases is and what are the different features. Now it's the competition time. We are five minutes late. So if you can open this link on your system, wandb.me slash UPC dash collab, uh, you all will, this will, take you to a collab notebook uh, that is yeah, with the title WANDB and UPC. And you will have all the information here for the competition. But I will run through this collab real quick and then we can start a competition. Uh, Agatha, can you put in the link? The chat well, can let me do it. Uh, if mm, some of you have never used Collab before, uh, please do let us know. Um, or if you haven't used Kaggle before, that's also a cool tool. Uh, do let us know too. Yeah. Uh, in the Collab notebook, if you scroll down, you will see the link to the Kaggle competition, but uh, I'm still gonna... Hold on. Yeah, this is the link to the Kaggle competition. I'm gonna drop it in the chat. Uh, you can just open it. And this is where you're gonna make the submission. So this is, uh, just let me just run through it real quick and then you can uh, get an idea of what is expected and what you can do here. So you will in, in, install a few things, import a few things, right? And you will download a data set called blood MNIST. So it's a MNIST kind of data set, but it's, uh, the cells of blood, right? And it has labels for like different diseases that that's connected to blood. So you download the data set, you have the uh, like a data loader in PyTorch that you create. Uh, and then there's some logic to validate the model. Uh, you create the three train data set, valid data set and test data set, and then you can like do some EDS as well, but let's skip that. We are using Tim. Tim is a very famous library in PyTorch for different image models. So we are gonna use MobileNet V3 large here uh, to train the model. We initialize a one db run, and then we do the normal back propagation, forward pass and backdrop here, like for epoch in the number of epochs. You train the model. So once you are done training the model, you will then generate a CSV file. Uh, yeah. So once you train the model, you run this cell under generate test submission. And then you when you run this cell, where in submission df.csv, submission.csv, you will get a submission.csv file on the left-hand pane of your collab notebook. Uh, I don't have that right now but i will show the next step which is you click on the you hover over the file you click on the three button and you do something like uh yeah download so once you do that you will have that downloaded on your local system you go to the kaggle competition 
you then click on the submit prediction here and then upload like by browsing the file you upload it to uh to the, the to the competition and then it will be automatically evaluated and you will have a score here that will pop up uh i guess we're gonna run this competition for 35 minutes maybe yeah. yeah so we're gonna minutes. run this yeah so we are gonna run this competition for 35 minutes uh so just run this collab notebook make changes maybe train for longer change the model maybe change the number of batch sizes etc it's up to your ml practitioner so i don't need to speak here so mm -hmm. generate the submission and just submit it and at the very end we'll see who who is winning and we'll have some swags for that person yeah top three participants uh we can start the clock now 35 minutes and uh, at the end of that 35 minutes we're gonna look at the results and the top three participants will receive a great swag from weights and biases um very fun thing to mention we will be all the time looking at the leaderboard checking how the score is doing uh, but we will be looking at the public one which is using 20 percent of your data and at the end, we will be looking at the uh, private leaderboard, which uses 80% of your data. So the final um, the final score may be a little bit different. Uh, and you can submit multiple entries. I think there is a limit of 20. So feel free to try as many times as you want. And Kaggle will choose your best submission. If you have any questions regarding the code or you know any uh, debugging problems, just let us know. Yeah, we will be here. So uh, good luck. <laughs>